Today, we have the first of two of the creation narratives in Genesis. Next week, we're actually going to look at creation all over again from a second perspective. But today, we will focus on the two tales, who wrote what, in the beginning and out of the chaos. But even before we get started today, you may be surprised to hear that there are actually two beginnings in your Bible. In Genesis 1.1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then a little while later, in Genesis 2.4, we read again, This is the account of the heavens and the earth and when they were created. And this is important to get right from the get-go because it has some implications for us. First of all, you may have heard along the line somewhere that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch called Torah by our Jewish friends. But this is the first five books of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the reason you may have been told that these books were written by Moses is because these first five books are also called the books of Moses. In fact, in John 4, Jesus himself says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I might say? So there you go. Pretty conclusive evidence. Jesus thinks Moses wrote the Torah, done deal, except not quite. Because in the Hebrew language, Torah means law. And it also refers to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So in Deuteronomy 4, for example, we read, this is the law or the Torah in Hebrew that Moses set before the Israelites. These are the stipulations, the decrees, and the laws Moses gave them when they came out of Egypt. So in one sense, Moses absolutely wrote Torah. The law came through Moses. But is Moses the one who wrote down the story of Moses receiving the law? Well, that has been up to debate for centuries. Now, even Jewish rabbis who took the view that Moses wrote down most of Torah still acknowledge that at least a few lines in there must have come from someone else. Lines like this one in Numbers 12. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. So humble, in fact, that he decided to write that down. In the third person, no less, just for a fact. Who knows? But this question of authorship really comes to a head in the 17th and the 18th centuries, where primarily German scholars start looking at these stories critically. And they realize a couple things. First of all, like we're going to see today, that there are often two accounts of major moments in Torah. And generally, those accounts will use two different names for God. And you can actually see this in your English Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, God is always God. That's the word Elohim. That's a generic Hebrew term for God. But then in Genesis 2, when the story starts again, God is now Lord, all caps in your Bible, and that's a very specific Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. So it's likely that what we have here are two different authors who prefer to use two different, although both very common names for God, and who each tell a different version of creation that emphasizes different aspects of that same God. Now, later when the oral traditions of the Hebrew people were gathered up and written down, the sages realized how distinct, but how important both of these tellings were, and so they preserved both of them for us. The funny thing is, at least here in Genesis, is that never seemed to appear to cause anyone a problem. They certainly aren't trying to pull a fast one on you or any funny business here, hide anything from you. They just plunk down two creation stories with two different names for God side by side. And I actually think that's pretty important. You see, ancient peoples knew that stories could illuminate the world. But they also knew that stories point us toward the truth. They don't monopolize it. And so for those who gathered up the book of Genesis for us, the fact that chapter one was true did not necessitate for them the rejection of chapter two. Both are telling us something important about God. Now, did God create humanity on the sixth day after everything else as we read in Genesis 1.26? 
Or did the Lord form a man from the dust of the earth before any shrub or plant had appeared on the earth, as we read in Genesis 2, 7? Well, the answer, it seems to be, was it doesn't matter, because that's not the question that these stories were written to answer. And this is the second implication of our two creation narratives. If it's not one person that's writing these stories for us, then who exactly is speaking to us when we read our Bible? Let's pretend our authors have some names here to help illustrate. Let's pretend Genesis 1 was written by Zipporah and Genesis 2 by Salome. When we read the text, who is talking? Is it Zipporah and then Salome, or is it somehow all God? Well, that's a good question, because this is actually one of the really complex realities in trusting a text like the Bible to guide us. Because the answer is, of course, somewhere along the lines of yes. Of course, we trust that God is speaking to us through the Bible, and we call the Bible the Word of God, in fact. But at the same time, it's unhelpful. We actually risk obscuring the meaning of a story unless we acknowledge the voice of the author who wrote and preserved these words for us. Because the simple truth is this, the writers of Genesis, our fictional Zipporah and Salome, they had no conception of the universe in mind when they wrote. No ability to imagine a Big Bang, no ability to grasp the scope and scale of galaxies or rotating planets orbiting burning stars. These concepts were completely meaningless to them. Remember that scene in The Lion King where Simba and Pumbaa and Timon are all lying in the grass talking about the scars? And Simba suggests that his father once told him that the stars are the kings of old looking down on them, caring for them. That seems reasonable. And Timon suggests that they're fireflies that somehow got stuck up in the big bluish black thing up there. And everyone thinks that's pretty reasonable. And then Pumbaa says, oh, I always thought those were balls of burning gas billions of miles away. And everyone laughs at the absurdity of the concept. I mean, that's the ancient world, right? And it's not that they're dumb, at a purely evolutionary level, our brains have advanced precisely none since the time of Genesis. We simply have centuries, millennia of incremental knowledge to stand on, and so, of course, we see the cosmos differently than they did. But that also means that we bring with us a different set of questions about the cosmos. We tend to ask how it all works, for which stories are ill-suited. They're far too prone to exaggeration and interpretation. But ancient people were asking, why? Why are we here? Who did all of this? What does any of it mean? And for those types of questions, stories are profoundly helpful because they tend to orient us in a direction rather than dictate to us. My kids are adopted. And increasingly, my son wants to know his story. What is my culture, he asks me. My daughter, who's indigenous, is also going to want to know her story as she grows as well. But it's not the details of what hospital they were born in and when it all happened that they're looking for, right? I mean, we have photographic evidence of all of that. We can pull out the proverbial slideshow and put it up on the TV. But they want to know the stories that give shape and texture and meaning to their place in the world. Where do I fit? Now, thankfully, as a family, we have both of the birth mothers of our kids available to us in our lives to help us with that. And not every adoptive family has the gift that we've been offered. But these are the types of questions that sit behind the stories of Genesis. Not the how that we're often looking for as modern readers, but the why that all of us need to search out for ourselves at some point. And as soon as you start to ask why, as soon as you shift from looking for facts to listening for a story, at that point, it has to become the voice of the storyteller that you are listening for. Because stories are told within a particular time and place to a specific people that have a shared experience of the world. And for Genesis to have even made its way to us thousands of years later, it first had to be deeply meaningful for a people who told and held on to that story. It had to answer questions for them 
in order for them to pass it to us. Now, that doesn't mean God isn't speaking to us in the Bible. Of course God is. But the way to think about it is this, that God is the one who is telling the whole story of the whole Bible that leads us to the word of God in Jesus. On a story-by-story scale, it is particular human beings that are inspired to write by God. It is particular human communities inspired by God to hold on to those words. It is particular human cultures inspired by God to collate and juxtapose and pass down the most meaningful stories that arise from within. And so when we look at Genesis, particularly those first 11 chapters that are more mythic in their scope, What we want to do is do our best to set aside our modern assumptions of the world and to read these stories as best we can through ancient eyes. That's what we're going to try to do in this series. But today, let's start at the start. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, right here, there's already some really neat stuff that's going on that's going to influence how we make sense of this tale. And first off, I've said this before, but in the beginning, that's a bad translation. Now, it's funny because everyone knows this, but in the beginning is just so deeply ingrained and absolutely iconic that no one wants to risk changing it in a Bible. I totally get that. I don't think I'd change it either. But in my Bible, for example... Uh, There is a little asterisk, and down at the bottom of the page, it then says, or when God began to form the heavens and the earth. And the reason for this is that the ancient Hebrews, or ancient cultures in general, in fact, didn't really have a conception of things just springing into existence. They saw things change and grow in front of them. Uh, They saw things give birth and create and die in front of them, but they didn't really conceptualize something coming out of nothing the way that we can today. For them, perhaps the most incredible thing that God could do was not to create out of nothing per se, but instead to mold the chaos of the world around them into something better. And what an interesting way to think about the world, right? Right? Like, I'm a modern thinker. I can't help but wonder about how the universe came to be. So, of course, I trust that God is creator. But what if I could expand my thinking to encompass the idea that perhaps God is most creative? Not simply in starting from scratch or starting over, but also somehow in the repair and the healing and the calming of the chaos that surrounds me. I mean, would that kind of ancient perspective and wisdom change the way that I saw my relationships or my career or the environment? I think it might. What if a God that shapes and molds my circumstances slowly into something healthier is more, not less powerful than a God who changes everything for me in an instant? I think that might radically change my commitment to the kind of slow, incremental growth in the areas that I need transformation. And let's be honest here, it might be a healthier way to think about change as well. But again, we're conditioned to ask questions that are shaped by our modern experiences. And I mean, look at everything that we can do. Look at what we can create almost, it seems, out of nothing. And so we say, well, for God to be bigger, better than us, God must be able to do things we can't to create out of nothing incredible. Ancient people looked at the world around them, overwhelmed by forces they didn't understand. And they said, look how God heals and calms and repairs and brings flourishing out of our confusion and fear. This is the height of creative goodness. Amazing. Now, one question is not better than the other. But when we try to force our questions onto ancient stories, we risk missing their intent. That's what I'm saying. Because the ancient question was not, how did the universe come to be? It was, how do we survive and thrive in the chaos of this world that surrounds us? So, let's talk about chaos and how God responds in this opening story. We read this, and the earth was formless and void. In Hebrew, these are the words, tohu vabohu. 
Now, two things are going on here. First, notice how empty and hollow those words sound when I say them, tovu vabohu. That's not an accident, that's onomatopoeia. Now, the Hebrews didn't call it that, we do. But they absolutely understood the ability of sounds to evoke emotion. And tovu vabohu is about the state of the world when God began to create, but it's also, it's designed, it's shaped to get you at some deep instinctive level to remember the feeling of being overwhelmed or losing your footing in the world. And that was particularly powerful for ancient readers because Tovu Vabohu was also a corruption of the name Tiamat. Now, Tiamat was the Babylonian god that represented chaos. And in the Babylonian story, Tiamat was this monstrous serpent-like creature that ruled over a world covered in swirling chaotic water. Sounds familiar, right? Except in this story, it was only when the hero Marduk challenged her and defeated her killed her and used her body to create the land that humans could occupy that chaotic world. So chaos or Tiamat or Tovu Vabohu, all of this is about the ancient conviction that the world is a scary and a violent place. And given that these are some of our earliest human stories, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, the world is a pretty hard place without much of what we have come to depend on today. Let's be honest here, all of us, we live in a part of the world where most of us would not survive a winter unshielded. I still wonder sometimes why I choose to live in a place where the air literally hurts for months at a time. It's insane. But let's try to assume that ancient perspective of the world for a moment, one that is fearful of chaos and Tiamat and Tohu Vabohu, and let's read Genesis 1 again. Yes, the world is chaotic. Yes, the water swirls and swells as we expect, but this time there is no battle. There's no chaos monster to defeat. There is only the spirit of God that hovers above the storm. In fact, the word chosen here is the image of a bird in flight, but it's not a bird flapping their wings, frantic activity like a hummingbird here. This is very specifically the image of a bird tracing out the thermals. The way that an eagle might circle and hover without seeming to need any effort to stay aloft. The image here in Genesis is very specifically not a battle between God and chaos, but instead the merging of divine calm into the chaos of the world. And this is what happens. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated light from the darkness the first day. God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate them. So God made the sky and separated the water under the sky from the water above it the second day. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear. And so it was the third day. So from the swirling and swelling of a primordial oceanic world, we now have day and night, earth and sky, land and water. In other words, there's a world that we can inhabit. And all it took was the presence of spirit. And so what do you do with a hospitable world? Well, the next thing you got to do is you got to fill it with something. So look what happens in the second half of the week. Then God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark the sacred times and days and years. We've got a sun and a moon to fill the sky now, day four. Let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. The air and the water are filled with life, day five. But the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind, and so it was. And then God created humanity in God's image. In the image of God, they were created, male and female, God created them. Finally, we have life to fill the earth, day six. And then, of course, there's a day seven, God had finished the work God had been doing, and so on the seventh day, God rested from all work. Now, try to set aside modern questions 
of how you can have day and night three days before you have a sun and a moon. And forget the fact that an Earth existing before a solar system is at least a little problematic and the math doesn't work very well. And instead, think about what this story holds for an ancient reader. First, the story is as we might expect, a chaotic mess of storm and water, all of our fears expressed in mythic form. But then, right from the drop, it's all different, isn't it? There is no warrior god, there is no chaos serpent, there's only a brooding mother hovering calmly above the chaos. Remember in that Babylonian story, Tiamat is presented as feminine? Here, the first description of God in your Bible is the feminine Hebrew, ruach, or spirit that floats gently above the chaos of your world. And when that gentle spirit meets the waters, we see three things, not a conflict like we might expect, but we see a forming and then a filling and then a resting. See, this is not an ancient attempt to communicate the science of creation. This is counter-programming designed to subvert the narrative of violent domination and bring hope to a frightened world. Yes, The world is big, says Genesis, but God is closer than you can imagine. And yes, the world is scary at times, says Genesis, but the answer to your fears is not more violence and war. And yes, the work is hard, says Genesis, but you can shape a life for yourself. You can cultivate a corner of your world and fill it with life in order to find rest. And look, I get it, we're modern people. We face different challenges and we have different questions, but we're not overwhelmed by storms and afraid of lightning the way that they were. But if we let it, this story is still profoundly formative for all of us in our place in the world. What do you and I do? What what do we do when we're overwhelmed? What do we believe sits at the foundation of our story? Will we give in to the idea that life is an endless fight against the force of chaos? Or will we settle into the trust that life itself is the product of a generous God that meets us with gentle welcome and profound strength in the midst of our anxieties? Will we despair the inevitable challenges we face in the world? Or will we enter the divine pattern of cultivating a better world slowly, filling it with our creativity, and then resting regularly to enjoy the fruits of our labor? Will we see the world through the lens of competition and battle, our success only at the expense of another? Or can we imagine that all those we encounter, not just those like us, but everyone is formed in the image of God and realize the implication that for us to truly rest, we must partner with God to cultivate a world where everyone can flourish. Because that's what this story is about. It's not about how the world came to be, it's about the story that sits behind our concept of the universe. A reminder of the calm and gentle presence that longs to bring peace and flourishing into every moment of worry that you encounter. And who invites you to see yourself reflected back in that divine image of calm and peace. And that is a story that is just as relevant today as it was in the beginning when God began to create.